1, Philippians 1. Let's talk about worthy of the gospel. Reading in verse 12, Paul says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Look at the next words of Paul in Philippians 1.21, some of the most famous words of Paul. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I want you to say those words with me this morning, if you would. For me to live is is Christ and to die is gain. Would you say it again? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Verse 22, if I go on, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ will abound on account of me. Look at verse 27 and we'll finish here. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. We'll finish reading right there. Would you pray with me and let's ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence with us. You said, whenever we gather in your name, you're here. Thank you for your powerful word. Your word is truth. Father, I pray that we would encounter you this morning through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen. During his earthly ministry... Jesus called the 12 disciples to himself and he sent them out to go preach the gospel. He told them, when you enter a new city or a town, search for a worthy person and stay with that person and bless his or her house. What did Jesus mean by that? Who is a worthy person? What distinguishes that person from anyone else. After all, we're all equally in need of salvation. None of us is less in need of salvation than another. We're all equally eligible for salvation. None of us is more deserving than another. Paul said Christ died for all people. So who could be distinguished as worthy? Well, fortunately, Jesus went on to describe a worthy person. A worthy person, in God's eyes, is someone who is receptive to the gospel. A worthy person is someone who readily responds to the gospel. A worthy person is welcoming to the gospel's messengers. A worthy person is willing to listen to the gospel message, is willing to support the gospel ministry. The book of Acts echoes this thought when it calls the Jews in the town of Berea noble because they were eager to learn the word of God. On the island of Cyprus, the governor Sergius Paulus was called intelligent because he was eager to hear the gospel. You know, in the book of Samuel, God says that he doesn't weigh people. 
He doesn't measure people the same way that we do. People look on the outward things, but God looks on the heart. God esteems people. He measures people based on their responsiveness to him. Paul echoes that thought again in the opening lines of Philippians. Chained to a Roman soldier, Paul writes, Whatever happens, live lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whatever happens, live lives worthy of the heavenly father who loved you so much that he handed over his only son as a sacrifice to atone for your sins. Whatever happens, live lives worthy of the Savior Jesus who humbled himself and became a man and suffered and bled and died on a cruel Roman cross to save you. Whatever happens, live lives worthy of the only message that's able to save men's eternal souls for there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved but the name of Jesus. What does it mean to live worthy of the gospel? Looking at Paul's words in Philippians 1, I see three things that I want to share with you quickly on this beautiful Sunday morning. What does it mean to live worthy of the gospel? Three truths in Philippians 1. First of all, to live worthy of the gospel means to live with worthy aspirations. It means to live with worthy aspirations. As you think about your own life, what are your aspirations? Right now, in this season of your life, what are your goals? What are you aiming for? What is it that you're working toward? What is it that motivates you? What gets you up in the morning? What keeps you going day after day? Are you aspiring to get an education? Is your aspiration to find a relationship? Is it your family to give them the best of everything? Is it your career? Are you chasing the American dream? More precisely, uh, are you chasing the Westchester County, Fairfield County dream? (laughs) Which has a way of subtly overtaking us. Uh, Are you chasing financial security so that you can retire early and enjoy yourself? Uh, Are you chasing a hobby or a sport or some goal? Uh, uh, Some of you might say, my aspiration right now is just to survive. My aspiration is just to get through today. I love these verses in Philippians 1 because they give us such a beautiful glimpse into the heart of Paul. They show us what made Paul tick. Some of the best loved words of Paul are right here. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Looking at Paul, I see a few things that we should aspire to as followers of Jesus. First of all, let's aspire to live in unison with Christ. Let's aspire to live in unison with Christ. For me to live is Christ. What does Paul mean by that? Well, for one thing, we are spiritually alive because of Christ and by Christ. You know, there's a defining moment of believing on Jesus. There's a moment when the gift of faith enters into our heart. And even though we might not understand it all, even though we still might have lots of questions and things we're working out, we just know that we know that in the deepest place inside of us, we believe in Jesus. In that moment of believing, we become united with Christ in such a way that I really can't even fully explain it to you, but we become united to Christ in such a way that his experiences on the cross and in the grave and in the resurrection become our experiences too. In that moment of believing, I am co-crucified with Christ. 
My old sin nature is hung on the cross. It's nailed and put to death. In that moment of believing, I'm co-buried with Christ. My old desires, my old way of thinking, my old way of speaking, my old way of living is buried and gone. And in that moment of believing, I'm also co-resurrected with Christ. My spirit, which was dead in trespasses and sin, comes alive again. I become a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away. Everything becomes new. I'm now free to walk in newness of life. Everything is different. Everything has changed for the better. Amen. You know, that's what we're celebrating this afternoon through the ordinance of believers' baptism. Over 25 men and women and young men and young women are signifying that they have been co-crucified and co-buried and co-resurrected with Jesus by faith. And they're sealing that transaction through this act of obedience to Jesus. And not only am I spiritually alive because of Christ, but I remain alive through Christ. What does it mean for me to live as Christ? It means that he made me alive and he's keeping me alive. Amen. To the Galatians, Paul wrote, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Amen. The life I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. To the Colossians, Paul wrote, for you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's what Paul means in Philippians 1.21. For me to live is Christ means that I have been united with Christ by faith. And that I now live my entire life in perfect unison with him. I live pursuing a continual relationship with him. I no longer live to please myself or to pursue my own personal agenda, but I live to please him and to do his will. I live being led by him. I live responding to his promptings. My life is now hidden in him. What should we aspire to as believers in Jesus? Living un in unison with Christ. And another thing I see, let's aspire to bring glory to Christ with our whole life. While Paul was dictating this letter to the Philippians, he was awaiting trial on capital charges before Nero, one of the most ruthless emperors in the history of Rome. My son Ben said to me, Dad, that would be like waiting for a trial in front of Kim Jong-un. You know how that's going to turn out. Paul didn't know what the outcome of his trial might be, but his main concern was that Christ would be glorified in his body, whether in life or in death. Paul's concern that was that the whole of his life would bring glory to Christ, all of him, body, soul, and spirit, that everything he thought, everything he spoke, everything he did with his body between the dates of his coming and his going would bring glory to Christ. Do you ever notice how on a gravestone there's always the dates of someone's coming and going and in between is just a little dash Two decades, four decades, eight or nine decades, doesn't matter. Everybody gets that same little dash. But it's what happens in that little dash that counts for all of eternity. Paul is saying here, I want everything in my dash to point to Christ. And that should be our aspiration as well. I want everything in my little dash to, to point to his great love, to his unfailing mercy, to his transforming power. Here is a faithful saying, Christ died to save sinners of whom I am chief, but now my life is hidden with Christ. Worthy aspirations, living in unison with Christ, bringing, to glory, bringing glory to Christ. Another I see, let's aspire to introduce others to Christ. Paul was chained to a Roman soldier uh, awaiting trial before one of history's worst dictators. But he wasn't worried about it. Paul was focused on the work of the gospel. 
Now I want you to know, he writes, that what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. Paul was chained to the elite soldiers from the imperial guard. Each soldier served an eight-hour shift and then changed out. So Paul took advantage of his captive audience and one by one he shared the gospel with the entire imperial garden, guard. That was Paul's great aspiration in life. Let's make it our aspiration too to take any and every opportunity we have to tell people about Jesus. You know, Paul was an Old Testament scholar. He was a genius. But do you know what Paul told the imperial guards? He simply told them his story. Paul simply told them his story from the Damascus Road all the way to that Roman dungeon. And that's all we have to do too. All we have to do is simply tell people our story. You don't have to be a biblical scholar. You don't have to be an apologetic genius. All you need is a story about what Christ has done for you. Once I was like this and then I met Jesus and now he's changed everything. Worthy aspirations. Living in unison with Christ, bringing glory to Christ, introducing others to Christ, and let's aspire to strengthen fellow believers in Christ. Amen. In kind of a rare moment, Paul has a little debate with himself in front of the Philippians. Paul's body was worn out for the sake of the gospel. You know, 10 years earlier, he wrote to the Galatians, don't let anyone cause me any more trouble because I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. 10 years earlier, he was already worn out. Now, now 10 years later, he's even more worn out. He's ready to go home and be with Christ, but the Philippians still need him. They still need his prayers. They still need his leadership. They still need his teaching. So Paul is resolved to carry on for their sakes. It was one of Paul's aspirations in life to foster the faith of fellow believers in Jesus, to, to nurture them along, to promote their spiritual growth, to encourage them and build them up, to pray for them. And that needs to be one of our aspirations too, to help our fellow believers along. As you think about your life, can you say that you're living for worthy aspirations right now? I don't mean what you did when you were young, before you had the obligations of family and career. I don't mean what you hope to do later when you're set for life and retired. Can you say that you're living for worthy aspirations right now in this season of your life? Can you say with Paul, for me to live is Christ? What does it mean to live worthy of the gospel? Three truths in Philippians 1. To live with worthy aspirations. A second thing I find. To live worthy of the gospel means to live with worthy attitudes. It means to live with worthy attitudes. I'm struck in Philippians 1 by Paul's amazing attitude. Have you ever tried to stay positive in miserable circumstances? Last year we were in Nepal and we spent one of the, I spent one of the most miserable nights of my entire life. We were in a village. It was beastly hot. It was pouring torrential like jungle rain. And we were staying in a guest house which turned out to be the town brothel. We had no running water. We had no electricity. We had no fan. We had no air conditioning. We had the windows open. And I swear to you, a bug, it was called a rhinoceros beetle, a bug the size of a robin flew into our room through the open window. I screamed like a little girl, ran out of the room. I, I left my poor children alone in the room. <laughs> it was miserable. And it was, it was like one night and we were, we were, having a hard time holding on to a good attitude. 38 of our teenagers and sponsors are leaving for Panama on Tuesday. And they might find themselves in some less than comfortable circumstances. Let's pray for them that the Lord helps them keep a good attitude. How do you think your attitude might be after five years in prison? How do you think your attitude might be if you had to sleep chained to a guard? 
Have you had to eat your meals and write your letters and wash and use the necessary chained to another person? Looking at Paul, I, I find some attitudes that we need to adopt as believers in Jesus. First of all, let's adopt a worthy attitude about God's sovereignty. Paul says something amazing here in verse 16. He says, I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. In Greek, that's called a divine passive. In other words, God is the one who put Paul in prison. One of my favorite sayings is, not everything in life is heaven sent, but everything is heaven used if we trust him. You, you know, that's true. God is not the author of many of the tragedies that befall us, but he does use everything for our good and his glory if we trust him. But in this case, Paul's imprisonment was actually heaven sent. Paul said, I have been put here. By whom? By God to defend the gospel. Wow. Wow. You want to talk about separating the men from the boys, that'll do it right here. Sitting in his chains, Paul embraced the truth that God is sovereign. He's in complete control and he has the right to do with me whatever he chooses. You want to talk about trust in God. You want to talk about total surrender. This is it right here. To make matters worse, Paul had some rivals in ministry. Paul wasn't in competition with them, but they were in competition with him. They wanted a following and the offerings that come with it. So they painted Paul in a negative light because of his imprisonment. Oh, Paul really blew it this time. Didn't listen to the prophetic warnings. Went to Jerusalem. God told him not to go. He messed up. He stepped in it this time, and that's why he's in this mess. But Paul wasn't moved by their talk. He shrugged it off. He said, what does it matter about their motives? God will deal with them. The important thing is Christ has preached. Well, what might happen if we reach that level of maturity, that, that level of trust and surrender to God's sovereignty? What if we could say like Paul, I have been put here by God. I've been put in this predicament. I have been put in this peril. I, I have been put in this uncomfortable place I have been put in this highly confining situation this very humbling circumstance I have been put here by God for his own sovereign purposes he has the right to do whatever he pleases with me and I'm going to trust him with the outcome for he knows the way that I take and when he has tried me I shall come forth as gold Worthy attitudes. God is sovereign. And let's adopt a worthy attitude about hardships and suffering. A little further on in this letter, Paul talks about wanting to know Christ in the fellowship of his sufferings. Here, Paul says at the end of chapter 1 that God has granted to us the privilege of not only believing on him, but suffering for him. How on earth could Paul call suffering a privilege? The, the apostles thought the same thing in Jerusalem after they had been beaten by the leaders in Jerusalem. They praised God for the privilege of suffering for Jesus. How could it be a privilege? Well, there are some blessings that come through suffering that don't come any other way. Here's just a handful. For one thing, suffering in Christ deepens our relationship with him in a way that nothing else can do. As we suffer, we identify with Jesus. We experience just a, a little taste of what he experienced. As we suffer, we, we understand better what the incarnation cost Jesus. We understand better what the cross cost Jesus. We understand better the extent of his sacrifice for us and we love him more for it. 
Suffering in Christ produces Christ-likeness in us in a way that nothing else can do. As we suffer, we learn to surrender completely to the Father's will, just like Jesus did. We learn to trust the Father implicitly, just like Jesus did. We learn to lean into the Father for strength and comfort, just like Jesus did. Suffering in Christ positions us to witness the gospel in a way that nothing else can do. In his chains, Paul reached some people that could not be reached any other way. The imperial guard was not about to show up at church on Sunday, so God sent the church to the imperial guard in the person of Paul. And they had to listen to Paul for eight hours at a time. And believe me, based on the book of Acts, we know bro could talk. He could talk for eight hours without ever coming up for air. At the end of the letter, Paul sends greetings from believers in Caesar's own household. If Paul had never been in chains, they would have never been reached. Even Nero himself heard the gospel from the mouth of Paul. If you're stuck in an uncomfortable situation right now, could it be, if you're stuck in a confining situation, if you're stuck in some humbling circumstances right now, could it be that God has put you there for the purpose of reaching someone that couldn't be reached any other way? Suffering in Christ provokes holy boldness in fellow believers in a way nothing else can do. Far from shackling the gospel, Paul's chains propelled the gospel forward. He says in verse 14, because of my chains, the believers in Rome have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. You see, far from repressing the church, there's something about persecution that ignites the church and causes it to explode in spiritual life and revival and growth. That story has been played out again and again in history. Beloved, we need a worthy attitude about hardships and suffering rather than seeing all hardship, all suffering as an attack from the devil or a sign of God's displeasure with us. We need the maturity to recognize that sometimes God works through suffering to accomplish some things in us and in his world that he can accomplish no other way. Worthy attitudes about God's sovereignty, about suffering, and let's adopt a worthy attitude about life and death. I want you to notice with me that although Paul was totally surrendered to God, he wasn't fatalistic. Paul did not feel helpless. Paul did not feel powerless. In verse 20, Paul says that he's hopeful and he eagerly expects good things. That that word eagerly expects, it means to, to crane your neck and look to see if something good is coming. It's like you're waiting on the Metro North platform and you, you crane your neck to see if the train is coming on time. That would be a good, rare, but good thing. And what is it that we can look forward to? Well, Paul says that we can eagerly expect God's help on earth. In verse 20, he says, because of your prayers and what the Spirit supplies, I eagerly expect to have sufficient courage to face whatever comes at me. Because of what the Spirit supplies, I eagerly expect to have the courage to share the gospel with Nero. Because of what the Spirit supplies, I eagerly expect to be able to face the outcome of my trial, whether it be acquittal or whether it be execution. That word for supply is a neat little word. The picture is a, a drama producer who provides everything that's needed for the production. So the producer bankrolls the production. He develops the script. He casts it. He directs it himself. This is actually exactly what Mel Gibson did in the film a few years ago, The Passion of the Christ. 
He personally financed the film. He was involved with the development of the script. He cast himself, the actors, for the play, and then he directed it. And that's what this word supply means. It means that the Holy Spirit will provide everything you need from soup to nuts. From start to finish, he'll provide everything all that you needed. He will personally ensure. He will personally intend. He will personally oversee and guarantee that you have everything you need for success. Whatever life throws at you, the Holy Spirit will provide you with everything you need to face it and to triumph. Whatever happens, live lives worthy of the gospel. How? Through what the Spirit supplies to you. What can we look forward to? We can eagerly expect God's help here on earth and we can eagerly expect eternal life. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I desire to depart and be with Christ for it is far better. Beloved, there's a truth that we need to embrace here. For believers in Jesus, death is not a tragedy. It's a cause for celebration. Death is something that we can eagerly anticipate. Now listen, that doesn't mean that we walk around with some kind of weird death wish. God has work for us to do here. He has people for us to love and look after. He has fruit for us to produce. He has joy here in this life for us. But it means that, that we don't have to dread death if we belong to Jesus. It gets lost in translation. But, but what Paul literally wrote here was to depart is much, much, much better. And here's the reason why, if we're believers in Jesus, the very moment that we depart this life, we go directly to be with him. Go directly to heaven. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Just go straight into the presence of Jesus. There are no delays. There is no intermediary state. There is no waiting room. Paul said it happens in the blink of an eye. We close our eyes here, and when we open them again, we say, Jesus, there you are. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Death is the moment when this life of faith is completed. It's the moment when our life lived in unison with him results in our being united with him forever in heaven. It's the moment when our transformation into his beautiful, glorious image is completed. John said in that moment, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Death is the moment when our fellowship in his sufferings is ended and all that's left to share is his glory. See, if for me to live is to please myself, then when I die, I lose everything. If for me to live is to satisfy myself, if for me to live is to make myself secure on this earth, if for me to live is to master some skill, some sport, when I die, I take none of it with me. I lose it all. But if for me to live is Christ, when I die, I gain everything, for I gain him who has been the object of my lifelong pursuit and passion. <laughs> what does worthy attitudes produce? Look at the fruit in Paul's life. Even though Paul was in prison, he had irrepressible joy. He said, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Even though Paul was in prison, he had immovable peace. What does it matter what they do? The important thing is that Christ is being preached. Even in prison, Paul had unshakable faith. 
Paul didn't know what the outcome of his trial might be, but he speaks by faith in verse 24. He says, since it is necessary for you to remain I know that I will remain. Now, Paul didn't know that. He didn't know what was going to happen, but he knew it by faith, and he spoke by faith. Even in prison, Paul had unquenchable hope. I eagerly expect and hope that I will have everything I need through the supply of the Spirit. What does it mean to live worthy of the gospel? Three truths in Philippians 1. Worthy aspirations. Worthy attitudes. Finally, to live worthy of the gospel means to live by worthy actions. Let me give you three things and we're done. Three things and we're done real quick. Looking at Paul's words, I see three actions for us as believers in Jesus. First of all, let's never stop boldly sharing the gospel. During his two years under house arrest, Paul never stopped witnessing Jesus. He shared the gospel with one imperial guard after another, eight-hour shift at a time for two years until every guard had heard about Jesus. I love the final picture that Luke gives us in the book of Acts. Luke says, for two whole years, Paul remained under arrest and he continued to preach the gospel unhindered. That doesn't mean Paul was unopposed. It means he was undeterred. And the believers in Rome continued boldly sharing the gospel even though it was dangerous for them to do so. Let that be our story too. You know, let them, let them say about us. You know those people uh, over there at harvest time, they never stop talking about Jesus. That they never shut up. They never quit. That they never stop lifting up his name. They never talk, stop talking yeah. ab- about his goodness. They just won't quit. You got to kill them in order to shut them up. They won't stop talking about Jesus. Let's never stop boldly sharing him. Uh, uh, worthy actions. Number two, let's never stop promoting unity in the church. Paul says, whatever happens, live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. Stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. I like Paul's attitude toward those who were in competition with him. Paul said, you know what? Let them do what they do the way they do it, and we're just going to keep on doing what we do the way we do it, and God's going to work through the whole thing. You know what, I think that's a really good way to be. I'm not going to participate in disunity. I'm not going to contribute further to disunity. Let them do what they do the way they do it. And I'm just going to keep doing what I do the way I do it. And I'm going to trust that God's going to work through them. And God's going to work through us. And Jesus is going to be exalted. And God is going to be glorified. Worthy actions. Never stop sharing the gospel. Never stop promoting promoting unity. Finally this, let's never ever stop praying. Paul was surrendered to God, but he was not fatalistic. Paul firmly believed that prayer changes things. That's why he never stopped praying for his friends. And he never stopped asking them to pray for him. In every one of his letters, in every one, Paul said to every church he wrote to, I always pray for you and you pray for me. We talked about that supply of the Spirit that gives us everything we need. Paul said that that supply of the Spirit came to him through the prayers of the Philippians. Beloved, God has chosen to work on earth through the vehicle of prayer. God responds to prayer. God is moved by prayer. He moves because of prayer. He answers prayer. So let's never, ever stop praying for each other. Let's never stop praying that God will supply each other everything we need to face whatever life throws at us. Let's pray that God will help each other to have worthy aspirations and a worthy attitude and to live by worthy actions. Whatever happens, let's pray for one another. 
that God will help us to live lives worthy of the gospel. Would you stand on your feet this morning and would you give Jesus, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords a great big praise in this place?